It's always great to be here. And through the years when I've spoken to this wonderfully astute group, I've described my latest findings, my research into consciousness as related to my work as an intuitive spiritual counselor. But today I want to describe my journey and what has brought me to my current passion. <laughs> Cliffhanger. Um, I had a great grandmother on my father's side who used to wake in the morning or wake in her sleep and tell her husband to, to hitch up the buggy so and so was ill. He never questioned her. My mother was a talented concert pianist and she would dream precognitively, precognitively at times and she once told me that she had dreamt a whole symphony in her sleep. Just wish she'd written it down when she woke up. She once dreamt that one of my brothers had overslept and missed a, a college exam. He confessed that that had happened the day before. <laughs> People used to say that angels sang when mother played. And when I, when I was four years old, I said to her, when you go to heaven, we'll write letters, which was a precognitive knowing that she'd be passing and we'd stay in touch. Both of my parents passed at the age of 51, four years apart from each other. So neither of my children met my parents, but when my daughter was four years old, she came down the stairs and said, I talked to your mommy today. I said, oh, not wanting to get all woo-woo about it, but still wanting her to trust her intuition. And I said, where were you? I was playing in my closet, and Grandma Ruth laughed about scratching in the bushes. No one knew that when Mother and I would go on brisk walks, the way your circula circulation gets your legs itchy, and we jump in the bushes, scratch all over, and laugh so hard we'd nearly fall over. <coughs> I picked Adrian up after school one day in fourth grade where she was playing with a friend and the housekeeper came to the door with her eyes as big as saucers saying, oh, su hija. I said, what? And apparently Adrian had read her palm and told her all about her boyfriend. <laughs> I've never done palm reading and I really hadn't discussed such things with my daughter. So when I got her in the car, I said, why did you do that? She said, I just thought there were things she ought to know. So in the 70s and 80s, I became a TM meditator. I was invited into the advanced SIDHI program, but I had to promise that I would step away from any psychic pursuits for six months. I declined. I continued to do readings in my family room when the kids were at school. And for a short time, I worked at Magic Island. Some of you might remember that magic club on the peninsula fashioned after the Magic Castle in LA. My husband and I were, my then husband and I were members. And it's where I learned how I would not choose to use my gifts. I think I write about that in Beyond Boundaries. Uh, and at that time, readings felt very linear. When I would pull in the information, I would find myself turning to the left when I was accessing the past and came to, to realize I was actually merging with my client's consciousness and seeing through their eyes at a strategic moment in their past. And to this day, when I go to the past, we work to shift their perception of the past, their relationship to the past, which then influences a positive, probable future where I go and check it out to see what's new and different. It's really, um, it's really unfortunate the people who reach me who think I can erase their past. My son once said, Mom, you better not call yourself a time-traveling clairvoyant. People will think you actually have a time machine. And it's true. Oh my God. So I assure people who, wish, who carry shame and guilt, who wish that the past, certain things in the past had never occurred, that our past only exists in the way we hold it in our consciousness. So then I would go to the future, see what's new and different, sort out the present, interpret for souls uh, on the other side, but it all felt very linear. And I, and I didn't think much of being able to interpret for clients, loved ones who might be in a coma, uh, dementia, stroke, autism. And the first time that happened, I said to a client, there's someone lying horizontal in a room with blinds and something about Victoria. My client said, my mother's on life support in a home on Victoria Street, and I don't know what's keeping her here. I said, it's the cat. Tell your mom the cat's fine, it's safe to go. 
she left a message the next day saying that she had done that with her mother that evening and her mom was gone in the morning. That's when I started get, getting the feel of the streaming consciousness that we are, with or without a body, and how seamless it is, timeless. So at that point, it still felt kind of linear, the way I was uploading, downloading this information. Uh, so after my divorce, I moved the kids north to a funky little town on the Car Carquina Strait that was affordable. And I wondered how I would be able to continue with my Southern California clients. Well, one client said just offhandedly, we'll do it over the phone. And that's worked just fine for years. And that's where I created the, the intro recording. I sat at my recorder, turning it off and on, and it wasn't until I'd finished the whole script that I realized you could hear my boombox clicking off and on. So the only place I could find recording equipment was up Main Street, behind the porno section of the video shop. <laughs> <coughs> and that's where I sat on, that, on a stool for hours recording that intro recording. So it went onto cassette tapes and went far and wide. And years later, living in New York, one of my earliest uh, interviews on Coast to Coast, I offered a free complimentary intro tape, intro tape. I'd wondered who stays up from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. listening to Art Bell. I found out yeah. truck drivers, <laughs> many, many of his listeners. My assistant and I couldn't get requests off the answering machine fast enough, and occasionally we could hear the, the caller shifting gears in the cab <laughs> of his truck. I want that their intro tape. So my kids left the nest early. I had to downsize overnight, moved to Oakland to a wonderful vintage apartment overlooking Lake Merritt. And that's where I sat in my Murphy bed closet office for six months writing Beyond Boundaries. After that, I moved to Colorado where I had spent summers with my grandparents. And one evening in the middle of a movie at the theater, my whole reality shifted. And it's as if my spirit had left the building and was already settling into where I would be residing on 13th Street in Manhattan. It only took three weeks to sell everything when I then arrived right there in Manhattan. I think one of my talks here in the past was how to let your spirit move you, because it really doesn't relate to time, and I feel that's what deja vu is. So when my body hooked up with my spirit that was already residing in Manhattan, I don't feel like I've been here before, but it was simply my physical self catching up. In New York, I became very fascinated with telepathy. Uh, I love to live where there's yummy diversity, various races, religions, beliefs, and so on. Love taking the subway. I feel itchy when I live where it lacks diversity. And maybe it's because of the dense population that there was just so much chatter in the airwaves. So I was sitting at Joe Jr.'s at the counter one day, and a man hops on the stool and starts singing, Every Little Breeze Seems to Whisper Louise, <laughs> that, my, that my father used to sing to me. I guess Yogi Berra would say, that was so coincidental, or that was such a coincidence. It wasn't coincidental. <laughs> I think Yogi Berra also said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> uh, I was sitting at Sammy's Noodles and overheard two fellows trying to conjure up a lie they would tell their friends, uh, their friend who they forgot to invite to lunch that day. I started thinking, <clears throat> just tell them the truth, just tell them the truth, and then I sent those thoughts. Then I overhear one of them saying to the other, maybe we should just tell them the truth. <laughs> I've also told the story of uh, meeting a friend at a restaurant for dinner. She was running late, so the hostess invited me to sit at the bar, this horseshoe-shaped bar. I'm sitting there feeling kind of bored and then think, maybe I'll connect with the higher self of everyone around the bar. So as I encouraged my clients to do, I imagined a ball of light above my head, pulled my energy up so as not to be imposing or let my Edith ego grab the wheel. Imagined the same uh, ball of light above the head of everyone around the bar. And then I telepathized, what an amazing
amazing adventure we're having here on planet Earth. May we all accomplish what we've come here to do in a higher way for the greater good. Three or four people cross clustered together, looked right at me and smiled. <laughs> I telepathized back the image of a thumbs up. <laughs> I love taking the subway and I'm pretty good at pulling in my antenna. People think I'm tuning in all the time, but why would I want to? But it's the most difficult on public transportation because I'm intentionally relaxing. And I'll tend to merge at times. So I look across the train car at a, a, a kid from the hood with his buddies. They're about to get off. And I see art all around him. So I telepathize to him, trust your art, not your friends, and you'll go far. I swear to you, he looked at me all the way across the, the subway car and went. <laughs> I turned to my friend and said, you're a witness. <laughs> I was in New York up until 9-11, which I watched from my rooftop. I wrote about that in Fearless Future, cliffhanger. And then I moved to London, where I married my British husband. And for clients who can't understand how I can read them over the phone, they would never get it across me being across the big pond. So I kept that on the down low, my location. And around that time, I was really getting fascinated with consciousness, exploring consciousness, because my readings seemed to get more multidimensional. I could go deeper. Everything's energy. Everything communicates. I was uh, interpreting for people's pets, favorite trees, thanking for the hug, cars, manuscripts, uh, loved ones, of course, houses as if they were becoming animated and, and having messages. Well, that's around the time that two people became my heroes, two formidable researchers, researchers in, the, in the area of consciousness. The first was Dr. Larry Dossey, who I met on a cruise where we were both presenting, gorgeous, tall Texan. And he helped me understand the concept non-local mind. My other hero was, is, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, who coined the term morphic resonance. And he's done wonderful uh, explorations in telepathy. If you, uh, his, on his website, he used to have recordings of him uh, on a panel at Cambridge. He's a Cambridge Harvard researcher. And it's funny to hear these professorial erudite professors saying, Dr. Sheldrake, telepathy, rally. <laughs> but he's really made wonderful advances. Uh, my favorite study of his uh, was working with a linguist with an African gray parrot named Nikissi with a vocabulary of a thousand words, not cognitive, not parroting, but cognitive. Nikissi would rake, wake his owner in the morning and tell her what she'd been dreaming. Wow. He was watching her dreams. And that's how pets, when they're looking above your head, they see your thoughts as pictures. So if you want your dog to sleep in the corner and not on your bed, you send it a picture of it going into the corner, you know, to sleep. And so pets have a lot to say. Cats often jump in to consultations saying, would you please tell her to stop rattling the plastic bag every time she opens the pantry? It drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, just, I was just mentioning that it's when I'm on the road and out and about that I get so distracted by children and pets. And I was just mentioning the last time I was in Portland, I was walking by Pioneer Square, and I heard this dog say, hey. I kept walking, hey. I turned around, and here's this big, white, drooling husky sitting on the retaining wall with, with his uh, owner. I go up to her, and I usually don't like to go into it. I said, sometimes I get things, and your dog has a message, oh, tell me. <laughs> And I said, well, pets usually show me their favorite things and what they're famous for. So I said, he's famous for, he's very protective of you. Of you. She said, oh, yeah, when we go to the park, it really bothers parents because he keeps me away from children and other pets. I said, and he loves Christmas. Oh, yeah, we just celebrated it early in July. And he loved the Christmas ornaments. <laughs> So when I wrote this up to put on my website, I described how I reached from above to give him a nice little pet to avoid the, dro the, stro the drool, the stream of drool. <laughs> so with these, these formidable heroes of mine, uh, Larry Dossey and Rupert Sheldrake, 
I started really uh, defining my ability to merge with others and how we all do it, but we're spooked about it. And then last year, uh, Dan Gerke in Atlanta sent me an email. He had been Googling higher self to higher self communication. Yes, it's getting out there. People are starting to expand to the notion of expanded consciousness. Dan wanted confirmation that he was indeed telepathizing with his wife. He'd been caring for her for four and a half years, diagnosed with Alzheimer's at 56, and was entering last stages of Alzheimer's. He'd been telepathizing with her <coughs> and, and found that it was just as he was dressing her for bed that they seemed to have the most interactive telepathic conversation. And he surmised that it might be because it's a, it's a time of day when everyone's, huh. So his initial conversation became a, my son says, don't call it a three-way threesome. <laughs> we were triangulating <laughs> where I was interpreting for Denise to confirm that, that Dan had been catching her thoughts. So yes, she pantomimes to me. When I was holding the cat the other day, I was telepathizing, telling you the cat needs a bath. Dan became an apprentice, and again, we were triangulating each, each weekly session. And Denise, it was fascinating to experience vast consciousness, Song's body. Not that different from when I interpret for souls on, in, in the non-physical. I used to call it the other side, but that implies it's a place. It's not a place. It's a state of consciousness. We've simply dropped the body. We're the same evolving consciousness. But to experience Denise in her wholeness with an overview of everything, and you know, she didn't suddenly become a guru, just like loved ones don't, we're the same evolving soul. But her, her lucid state, her, she's so present, and Dan said what I was describing was her characteristic humor, her love of nature. And then when he'd ask about her, her care, it was almost like that body was a distraction, like what? Oh, what do you want to know about that? as if she was running her body up with a remote control. You know, these golf carts we call our bodies, you know, moseying around on planet Earth. So at one point, Denise projected three different facilities, memory care facilities, that Dan had yet to go look at. And which one she would prefer, where she's now been residing for over a year. Her daughter became an apprentice and Phoenix wanted to fine-tune her ability to telepathize with her mom. And not too long ago, Denise, uh, Phoenix was going to, to fly to, to see her mom, and Denise is projecting an, a garment that with a splash of orange. Phoenix said, oh, that's, that's an outfit or a garment I just put in a bag to take to mom. And I said, well, not to hurt your feelings, but she's saying she really doesn't need it. So this lucid uh, stream of consciousness, uh, and it really excites me to, as, as people learn about this, trust their own sense of doing telepathy. But it can make some people crazy. Was that my voice? Was that her voice? Was that God? So it's not for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but that it's possible. And when I started working with Dan, he reported, uh, that when, when he would dress Denise in the morning, she was often uh, having tantrums and anxiety, lots of frustration. Well, frustrated because they're not being heard. And so one morning, he, he said, she, he telepathized, you're so calm. Uh, how come? And, and she telepathized back because we're going to be meeting with Louise. She was going to be heard. So if doctors knew that the people who do this for those with dementia, the change in behavior. We all want to be heard. But my gosh, we're not these bodies, and we're certainly not uh, who we are in various states of consciousness. There was a beloved yoga teacher from Southern California who sent me uh, lots of referrals, and she's now, gosh, it's been 10 years in the, in the facility with Alzheimer's. And when she first was starting to seem not that present, I, and I said to a friend of hers, it's like the light's going out. And no one knew that she would be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. When I first tuned into her, I said, so 
so Judy, what is this for you? And she said, it's the first time no one's asked anything of me. My favorite expression, you never know what's for what. So this, this streaming consciousness is a, wealth, a wellspring of information. It's consciousness, seamless. Uh, trust, you know, trust that your, your animals are looking over your head at your, at your thoughts, at your pictures. Trees often uh, want me to thank clients for the hug. Uh, one client and his wife are, are uh, on a cycling team. And in the middle of his reading, you know, these energies kind of interrupt at times. Big tree pops in and, and wants to thank him for the hug. He knew exactly the tree. It's a 900-year-old tree where the cycling team meets. And he sent me a picture of them all surrounding this very old tree and the wife hugging it. On the website, uh, if, you, if you do a search for Tina, the tree lady. Fun story, I was in Seattle and I was reading Tina. And all of a sudden, in the middle of, of, the, of our session, it was the year that um, the ring, I think, came out. Or Lord of the Rings, yeah. So there was an image of like a tree person coming towards us. And it had a message. And I said, I don't know, there's a, I'm just the interpreter, the, the, the messenger. I said, there's a tree coming towards us and it has a present for you. Well, at the end of her session, we went upstairs and my hostess greeted us and she handed Tina a, a watercolor of a tree. And she said, I was just walking uh, down the hallway and it fell off the wall. She said, I got it at a, at a swap meet or a estate sale, whatever. And I guess it's for you. So the connectivity of us all connected to everything is unbelievable. And our ability to connect from the heart, that's the con. So that thank you. I didn't know that I'd have enough time, but I guess I told my stories kind of quickly. I, I'm not an extreme empath. Um, and maybe because I desensitized myself when I used to teach behavior modification to psych techs working with developmentally disabled children at Fairview. Maybe that gave me a little more objectivity. I think Carolyn May said that when you, when you get emotional, it pollutes the information. But I've had several apprentices who are extreme empaths. Sympathy is understanding what someone is going through. Empathy is feeling it. And it really gets in the way with very intuitive people. And Brad is an apprentice, very right and left brain. <coughs> and he's an engineer and an extreme empath. He used to hear people discussing their maladies, and then he'd run to the medical dictionary to see what ailed him. He didn't take on their, their uh, symptoms, but he was feeling their malady. Uh, we created a template uh, for some visualizations for him to separate from others' feelings and emotions. And then with apprentices, we customize a template so that they can pull in the information. Well, first I put them through exercises to outsmart the censoring left brain rational mind. And I can almost hear a click when people go from their left brain to their heart, mm. where, the, where the intuition comes in. And I can hear a click when they go from their heart back to their left brain. And I'll digress here a bit, so try to stay with me. <laughs> One of my exercises with apprentices is going to Future Fridays. And we toss out the fish hook to a, that future moment where they will have accomplished their list of things to do. So I go there, take them with me beyond time. I have to desensitize them about the illusion of linear time. And we were, we were there, and I'm seeing her office and the stack of papers she needed to do and a few photos. And I said, and we're needing to put something outside. I don't know if it's for the mailman or if it's your recycling day. She said, it's my recycling day. So we, came, we finished the exercise. She said, that was so cool. We, we went to the future. And then I could hear a click. She was back in her rational mind, and she said, how did we know that really happened? <laughs> <laughs> so back into the heart, getting people in the present moment, when they're telling their story over the phone in a consultation, and I'm saying, well, it's their dime, but I'd like them to get their money's worth. <laughs> and so for one client, I've told this story. I said, let's see, how can I bring her to the present? I see you have a dog. How did you know? I'm psychic. <laughs> 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 
I say, can you go to the feeling of hugging your dog? And then I hear, Rex, no, don't go to your dog. Go to the feeling of hugging your dog. Pause, click, oh. <laughs> and then I had her in the present moment. And you asked, <laughs> when did I know I had these gifts? <laughs> I do digress. So I don't think I'm an extreme empath, but I think I feel what people are feeling, but I had no idea I was merging. And as I really became more cognizant of my, and observant of my gifts, it, it let me define it better. And so the merging is telling me a whole lot about telepathy and how we are all one. And when I go to the past or a potential positive future moment, I'm seeing through their eyes. I often interpret for future partners who the present self has yet to meet. I never want the future information to take a person out of the present. So I put it this way, that your, the portal to your best future is by living fully in the present. Taking responsibility, observing repeating things, healing from the challenges, rising up rather than spiraling downward. I don't do new age audiences anymore. It used to wear me out. I would start yawning because it many times was people looking for magic outside themselves rather than being in the present, living fully and making use of their challenges. So the present, the future can point them in the direction of a new potential positive future. Some people don't know they deserve greater joy. Uh, and it kind of gets them in the groove of this timelessness and multidimensionality.